I would like to welcome everyone to today's Oxford Brain Diagnostic Seminar. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Renaud Lejoie. Uh, but first of all, Renaud, just uh, to introduce ourselves to you, um, uh, OBD uh, is a small company started as a spin out from Oxford University. Uh, we're working to change how people think about brain health using our technology to take brain measurements from uh, MRI scans uh, based on uh, uh, changes in cellular structure. Uh, and we're working to support pharma and biotech uh, in drug development and to help clinicians, uh, of course, uh, to develop a more personalized approach detecting Alzheimer's disease and other brain disorders. Uh, so that's our kind of uh, our mission and our role. Uh, now to welcome you, I'm very pleased uh, to have you uh, present to us today. Uh, Dr. Renaud Lejoie ha has conducted his original neuroscience uh, degree work in, in Paris, I believe, uh, before moving uh, to University of California, Berkeley, uh, and you're now postdoctoral fellow at the UCSF uh, Memory and Aging Center, is that correct? Renaud? Yeah, well, uh, my officially my postdoctoral fellowship um, ended last summer, and I'm, I'm a, I have a staff researcher position now. Excellent. Very good. Uh, good. So you'll be you'll be there for 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 some for the sort of foreseeable future. Is that correct? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much for making time uh, early in your morning, uh, and uh, please tell us about your work. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. And um, um, you know, this is the kind of good reason to get up early and and go and Zoom at eight a.m. Not not all eight a.m. Zoom meetings are worth it, but this one. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about, um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm going to try to summarize um, a, a few studies in a 30 minute presentation. I, I just want to give you an overview of what we've been doing um, here at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. And um, although my training is originally in, in psychology and neuroimaging, um, I, I think what I've really appreciated a lot in the last year um, or a couple of years um, at the at UCSF is the opportunity to learn about related fields. And, and in this talk, I'm trying to mix a, a, a little bit of um, post-mortem neuropathology data um, uh, with the neuroimaging um, investigation. So um, I'll just start by saying I have no disclosure. I'm funded by the Alzheimer's Association and the um, NIA here. Um, and basically what I'm gonna present in this talk it's kind of a mix of three papers uh, that came out in the last couple of years. Actually, the paper in Brain is just in press and uh, should be in the July issue, I, I think. Um, and so all of this has to do with, with um, um, Alzheimer's disease using neuroimaging or neuropathology and, and how we can try to finally tackle the issue of um, heterogeneity uh, in the patients. So please um, interrupt me if you have any, um, if, there's, if I say something that doesn't make sense to you or anything, and of course we'll have um, questions in the end. Um, I'll just start because it's always the last slide and we always rush uh, to go through it, but I just want to start by thanking everyone. Um, this is our lab at UCSF, uh, my mentor Gil Rabinovich and everyone um, the way lab meetings are uh, now. I guess. Um, also the UCSF Brain Bank um, crew, that's uh, really amazing and that they taught me a lot in the last in the last couple of years. Uh, and then the Jacobs Lab at UC Berkeley. Um, um, I, I did a quick um, uh, postdoctoral fellowship there and uh, I'm still working very closely with them. It's um, an amazing team. So, you know, the, the, the key of my presentation, what's at the core of it is the, the idea of um, Alzheimer's disease presenting as a heterogeneous uh, disease. And I think I'm trying to um, distinguish different components of this heterogeneity. Um, the first one that I'm, I want to uh, think about is the age of onset. And I want to be very specific that in my entire uh, presentation, I'm only talking about sporadic AD, uh, not autosomal dominant forms. But even within the sporadic AD, we have a very uh, impressive range of um, age of onset. And some patients develop their symptoms in their 50s, although it's rare, but it's still possible. And, and some patients will develop symptoms in their 90s. So there's a lot of variability in the age of onset. And again, uh, early onset uh, is, is actually um, not synonymous with autosomal dominant AD. Um, the other component that uh, is really interesting, uh, of interest to us is the clinical syndrome. And, you know, the kind of like a typical presentation, this a slowly progressive amnestic dementia. Um, we, we know now that this is not specific nor sensitive to detect the effect of Alzheimer's pathology on the brain. 
And actually, if you look at the clinical criteria for Alzheimer's dementia, they've changed from 84 to 2011. And um, you needed to have uh, major pre uh, memory predominant uh, deficits in 84 uh, until, until more recently. And, and these um, memory deficits are not required anymore. Um, there are um, this, this growing acknowledgement that other forms exist. And you know, um, in this axis here, um, I, I, I hope you can see my, my uh, cursor. Um, you know, I'm representing it here simply as a one axis, but actually it should be a multi-dimensional um, uh, dimension as well, um, um, because we know that many different um, um, syndromes uh, can um, be the consequence of Alzheimer's pathology. We have this like two um, uh, very specific phenotypes, the language or visospatial predominant uh, deficits, uh, logopenic variant PPA and posterior cortical atrophy that are really well described. And then there's also the emerging understanding that sometimes Alzheimer's disease presents uh, with major behavioral or dis-executive executive um, sim uh, symptoms, and even sometimes with, with motor deficits. So there's a lot of variability in here. And um, th this is just um, a, a very recent review that came out in Lancet Neurology, um, I think a couple of months ago, that talks about this um, atypical phenotypes um, in, in details. It's really, a really good review. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about these different axes um, um, as conceptually orthogonal is because we really try to, to disentangle what, what they are and how these two things associate with brain disease. Although uh, in, in real life, we know that these typical uh, presentation of Alzheimer's disease that's more amnestic is usually a later onset and that the, uh, the other forms, the non-amnestic forms tend to be younger onset. But again, th these are two ends of the uh, of a spectrum that is, that is uh, really um, uh, more subtle than this. Um, and of course, all of this is di different from the clinical staging. So in any of these forms, you, you have a progression of symptoms uh, that is, again, orthogonal to these dimensions. Um, the last point I want to introduce is the um, APOE4. Uh, and I think it's really interesting because, you know, we all, we all learned that APOE4 um, is the main risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. But actually, it's not just a risk factor or it's not a risk factor for any type of Alzheimer's disease. And usually, um, APOE4 is associated with a, an earlier age of onset, but also mainly amnestic phenotypes. Uh, so there's something that um, APOE might not just be a risk factor, but also influence the way the disease presents in the brain. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking here about very, very um, extreme cases of this um, clinical heterogeneity, but the, we know that the clinical and radiological heterogeneity in Alzheimer's disease is everywhere. And, you know, even when you look into um, ADNI, uh, which is uh, a cohort that's uh, very uh, like that's been used by, uh, I assume thousands of paper by now. Uh, it, it's not a cohort that is meant to be diverse in clinical presentation, but it is. And the reason why we care about all of this is that this heterogeneity is interesting, but it's also a problem for us if we're thinking about tracking disease progression or detecting disease. And um, based on these different features, there is. Um, there's a complexity in capturing uh, capturing the disease with a one metric that would fit for everyone, and I think this is really a, a growing acknowledgement in the field that we need to uh, to be better at um, getting personalized indices um, of disease for different patients. So in my talk, I'll, I'll be presenting about these different dimensions I presented: the clinical syndrome, the age of onset, and APOE, and how they're related to brain pathology and and and, and disease course in AD. And um, all the, all, all the data I'm going to show you is um, data coming from patients who are um, clinically impaired. They all have a mild cognitive impairment of dementia. So I'm not talking about preclinical AD at all in my talk. And I'll be presenting about two different cohorts that are uh, from the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. Um, the two cohorts are completely non-overlapping. Uh, one is uh, neuroimaging. Um, so uh, patients who have multiple types of different uh, neuroimaging techniques. And all the patients are amyloid positive. So we know they're somewhere on the Alzheimer's spectrum. And for the autopsy data set, I'll be presenting about uh, patients who all have a pathological diagnosis of AD. Um, so one thing that I want to make very clear here is that the variability I'm talking about uh, in, my, in my studies is not variability due to misdiagnosis or to patients being called Alzheimer's when they don't actually have Alzheimer's pathology. 
everyone has a biomarker or pathological um, um, evidence for Alzheimer's. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the samples that we're working on uh, are meant to study this heterogeneity, but they're not generalizable in the way that um, our sample is enriched in these atypical presentation. And there's also a very uh, poor uh, representation of the population. Uh, it's mostly a uh, white sample and uh, usually highly educated um, patients. That being said, I'm, I'm gonna start by um, showing data from this neurology paper that came out. And here we looked at three different phenotypes of Alzheimer's disease patients with amnestic AD, uh, posterior cortical atrophy and logopenic variant PPA. And these maps show you the average um, amyloid burden measured with uh, PIB PETs. Uh, PIB is the, the first tracer that was developed um, and published in, in 2004 already. And what you can see is really that amyloid in these three phenotypes, amyloid is really all over the brain. It's very widespread and it doesn't really seem to distinguish the, the three variants. When we did conduct some um, uh, statistical testing, we got some slight differences, but they don't survive multiple correction. They're, they're, everything is weak. Um, the pattern is really different with Talpet, and this is using flow tau CPR, which is also this tracer that you might have read about as um, T807 in the beginning and then AV1451. Um, and this tracer binds to um, neuritic uh, tau, um, like tau and, and tau tangles and neuritic plaques. Um, and here we have very, uh, very um, uh, different distinct patterns. And that um, you know you, you can see are really strikingly different um, when you assess them statistically. With the posterior cortical um, atrophy variant having a lot of occipital binding, and the logopenic variant with major language deficit having a very um, asymmetric pattern with uh, left predominant uh, temporal parietal binding, and there's actually a little more um, medial temporal lobe. Uh, it doesn't show so well here, but you can see in the comparison on the right um, more medial temporal um, tau in the amnestic syndrome. So we know that like tau seems to be more associated with uh, this um, um, uh, um, clinical syndromes. And when we looked at um, structural MRI using voxel-based morphometry, uh, not, nothing, nothing uh, crazy about the method here, we do uh, see that the, the pattern of tau really seems to mirror the pattern of structural MRI. And that actually leads me to another study that we did that tried to investigate a little more the relationship between tau and, and structural MRI and um, we were lucky enough to have some patients who came back to us with um, uh, for an, a second MRI uh, around like one, uh, one and a half year after the first um, session of imaging. And we measured uh, um, brain atrophy over time with this uh, technique that at least one of you should be familiar with uh, in, on, in this panel uh, to measure longitudinal changes in, 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 in brain uh, structure. What we saw is here on these plots, the x-axis shows the baseline abnormalities uh, measured here on these scans. So baseline amyloid, baseline tau, baseline cortical uh, thickness uh, at baseline in the entire cortex and how it related to the y-axis being the longitudinal rate of atrophy. What was uh, really clear here is that uh, baseline tau was the best predictor of um, um, uh, future atrophy. Um, but this is just looking at global quantity qu quantity of atrophy, if you say so. Um, what we also wanted to look at is how the spatial information in tau pet could predict not only how much atrophy is going to happen, but also where. And here you can see, and this is just one case, we, look, we have this um, map of Jacobians here in the middle showing um, brain shrinkage in, in the regions in red and um, how it related to, uh, how it really resembles the baseline map of, of tau pet here at baseline, not really so much atrophy. We quantify this with this correlation method. And overall, for all the patients, we had a pretty strong correlation between baseline tau patterns and baseline uh, and patterns of future atrophy. And this is just showing here in um, four different patients, uh, blue is amyloid, green is tau, and um, purple, pink is their future atrophy. And you can really see how, um, like these patients were actually randomly sampled and how the baseline tau really forecasts uh, where atrophy is going to be uh, in, in this patient. Um, okay, so we have this really striking uh, finding of tau pet predicting, uh, forecasting um, future brain atrophy. Uh, oops. Um, so this is about the, the relationship between tau and atrophy, but um, going back to the question of the heterogeneity in, in age of onset in, in our patients, uh, 
Um, you can see our, our sample here is very has a very wide um, age range, and we have some patients in their late 40s, uh, some patients are in their 80s, or actually even one in, in their 90s. Um, the, the age of onset and the age uh, at which we scanned patients had nothing to do with how much amyloid they had in their brain, but it was really strongly related to tau and in this very, uh, very strong uh, negative pattern. And uh, this sample is the same I showed you before. It includes these atypical variants of um, PCA and LVPPA. And we actually saw that this uh, relationship with age existed within each syndrome. It, it's not driven by these atypical syndromes. It is really, um, all the lines are really impressively parallel. And we do see um, that younger patients have more tau regardless of their, uh, of their syndrome. When we digged a little, uh, a little more into the spatial information in here, uh, we actually saw that this is a map of the correlation between age and, and talpet signal. And we see that this, this, this negative relationship is really found all across the brain, but mainly in the frontal and parietal area. And if anything, there's one region that doesn't show this association, that's really the, the temporal cortex. Um, so the temporal uh, burden of tau seems to be pretty invariant uh, of, of age of onset. And uh, like this is a finding that's been shown by other groups um, uh, in the last few years. What, uh, what I really want to emphasize is that this is cross-sectional data. It doesn't mean at all, some people get really confused with this. It doesn't mean that tau decreases with time. It means that younger patients um, have more tau. And there's this study from the Mayo Clinic that shows um, over time, the patients in blue, uh, younger patients have more tau at baseline and they increase faster. So this is just, a very a very um, a pattern that we see in everything we're looking at the early onset uh, form of the disease are more aggressive uh, probably because of this um, higher tau here and so uh, we try to replicate this finding of higher tau in younger patients in the in the brain bank data sets and here we have almost 150 patients um, uh, with a neuropathological diagnosis of AD so they all have amyloid and tau and we used this um, method that was developed here at UCSF by Leah Greenberg and, and, and her student, Katrin Pedersen. Um, and they developed this method to quantify um, neurofibrillary tangle density uh, in, in brain regions. And they sample these six brain regions. You can see uh, four regions in the cortex here and, and two regions in, in, in the hippocampus. And I think the reason why it matters is that, you know, all the staging- No, no sorry. Could yeah, I ask a question very quickly? Um, you, you said neuropathological diagnosis of AD. Is that is that as in a neuropathological confirmation of a clinical diagnosis? Did they have clinical assessments? Yes. Well? Yeah. Very good question. They all have some. Um, actually, we 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 went. There's a flowchart in the paper. It's the paper that's in uh, in Press and Brain. There's a flowchart explaining what how we selected the sample. And actually, we started by taking patients with a clinic uh, with a pathological diagnosis of AD, regardless of symptoms. Then we uh, got rid of the patients with um, co-occurring um, FTD, and we got rid of the only two um, uh, uh, individuals who didn't have symptoms. Um, there were okay. only two people that um, were, as far as we know, cognitively normal, but um, all of them have um, had MCI or dementia uh, when they were um, alive and had amyloid and tau um, at, at autopsy. Great. And the Thanks. reason why, like, I think actually one thing that I really learned uh, and reflected on in the last year is how um, as neuroimagers and biomarker researchers, we really rely a lot on uh, pathology as a gold standard for what we um, develop. And, and I'm not sure that the measures of neuropathology are always the good one to use as gold standard because a lot of these measures are not quantitative by nature. And here, you know, uh, all these patients, like the different four rows, I, I don't know if you can see the details, but um, the four rows are four patients that were all diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease with BRAX6, so meaning they have tangles all over the brain, they have tau tangles in their motor cortex, but still there's a huge variability in how much they have, because the BRAX staging or the tau staging phasing for amyloid is, is just topographical. Um, you get assigned to a, a certain stage or phase based on whether they find um, amyloid or tau in given regions, but it has nothing to do with how much there is. And I think that we can expect that the, you know, our measures in vivo might be reflective of the quantity of the, of the pathology burden more than just where, where it is.
And so when we looked at this, when we use um, this quantitative uh, measure, we, we look here again at age of um, at symptom onset on the x-axis and, and the tau tingle and, and the y-axis. And for all these uh, cortical regions, you know, we see this very steep negative relationship exactly like we saw with PET. And uh, when we probe the hippocampus, we actually don't see this relationship. It's a very weak relationship. So the finding from the brain bank was really interesting because it really confirmed what we see with PET, that older age of onset is associated with less tau in the cortex, but not in the medial temporal lobe. So it's not just that there's less tau overall, it's the pattern, the distribution is a little different between early and late onset. Um, like I, I mentioned before, um, early onset Alzheimer's disease has been shown before to be a more aggressive uh, disease than uh, later onset. There's a paper showing there's a faster clinical decline or a higher atrophy rate. And this is the data from the brain bank uh, uh, data set, all the patients that were path proven AD. Uh, and you can see here their decline in, in MMSE over time. If you fit uh, a model into this data and you try to predict a five year cognitive decline uh, in these patients at age 58, uh, in five year patients lose 20 points on the MMSC. At age um, 74, they only lose um, basically almost half of it. So the cognitive decline is, is really uh, is really different here. Sorry, Renaud, could I just yeah. ask a question? Sorry to interrupt. When you say early onset is associated with a more aggressive disease, is that gender specific or is that just gen is that a general statement? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, we actually, one thing I'm not presenting in this day and in, in this, um, in this uh, presentation is that uh, from both the imaging and the neuropathological uh, data sets, we did find that females had um, higher burden of pathology, higher burden of tau. It's replicating these two independent um, uh, study, but for some reason, you know, it's still always a little hard with the brain bank data because you're never really sure, you know, you, you never uh, test patient right before um, uh, death. So there, there's a little more uh, variability and noise in this. But in our um, uh, neuroimaging sample, um, females had more tau pathology, but they were not performing worse. So for some reason, they seem to be able to cope with the pathology, at least at the time we got them, uh, a little better than males. Uh, and that was interesting. We haven't seen um, uh, interaction between age and sex, but we might be a little unpowered, um, uh, underpowered to, to see this. Uh, we're hoping to get more, uh, more information. I think. I think the, the third variable that we should throw in there is APOE4, because mm -hmm. uh, there is a literature showing that APOE4 is, is, is more detrimental in, in females compared to males. So I think this is, uh, but of course, for like a triple, um, uh, a three-way interaction, we'll, we'll need a lot more data. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, talking about this, you know, this uh, more aggressive pattern early onset, one thing that we looked at, uh, going back to the study about longitudinal atrophy, what we did see is that um, our um, younger patients tended to have um, higher atrophy rates, so more aggressive disease. And, what, and so we know that younger patients have more tau, they have more um, um, like steeper, uh, steeper rates of atrophy. And we ran this uh, mediation analysis showing that actually um, um, the fact that young onset patients have more tau could explain why they have um, um, more aggressive um, atrophy over time. So there's all of this seems to be, um, you know, going together. Um, the one thing that isn't going in the same line is another thing. So right now I've been describing a lot about the the, the Alzheimer's pathology in these patients. But what we know, and it's been shown by many groups, is that Alzheimer's disease never, uh, almost never happens um, in isolation. And there's a lot of data here from, from the Rush group that's really uh, interesting, showing the, co, um, the very frequent co-occurring uh, pathologies. Um, but all these studies are usually in, in older patients. Um, and we were curious to see what it, um, what it looks like in our young onset patients. So we did, um, again, in our brain bank data, we looked at a, um, a bunch of different uh, neuropathologies that uh, might co-occur with Alzheimer's disease. We have CAA. So CAA is, it, it's, there's, there is controversy whether it should be considered as a, as a co-pathology, given that it's the same, um, uh, you know, uh, protein as, as amyloid plaques, uh, but also considering Lewy body, uh, TDP43, hippocampal sclerosis, AGD, and vascular brain injury. And what we see is that if we count how many neuropathologies patients had, again, all these patients have Alzheimer's disease, uh, 
but younger patients, like with um, uh, um, older age of onset, tended to be associated with uh, more uh, numerous uh, coexisting neuropathologies. Although you can see from this plot, there's a lot of variability and you can still um, develop a disease at age 40 or 50 and have a lot of um, other uh, co-pathologies in your brain. So going into the detail, we did see that a lot of these individual uh, co-occurring pathologies um, happen more frequently in late onset patients. The percentage on these plots are the percentage of patients who don't have um, this co-pathology. So we can see that some of them are very frequent. Some of them are actually only frequent in older age. But what was interesting is that this pattern was not what we saw for everything. And, and here, sorry, I, I didn't say it's written uh, in the corner here, but like for the display, I'm just uh, splitting the group in early and late onset with a threshold of 65 just to, just to show the data, but it's the same if you look at age as a continuous variable. And, uh, but this pattern was not seen for everything. And if you consider CAA or they rebody, so alpha synuclein pathology, um, it's, it's very common in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease regardless of age. And we did not see uh, a difference. Uh, the only thing is that in, in early onset, we had um, a more frequent um, Lewy body um, um, feature that was more amygdala predominant, like the distribution of alpha synuclein was a little different in early onset. But um, what was really, uh, really intriguing is, is how frequent um, some of these pathologies were even in, in early onset. Um, so the, the last uh, data I want to show you uh, regards APOE4. I mentioned it's the main risk factor for AD, and in our sample in the in the in the neuroimaging sample, uh, we actually saw this extremely focal um, effect of APOE4 on the medial temporal lobe. Um, and if you go, uh, if you look a little closer, it's really, really, really in these um, typical entorhinal hippocampal regions, where we see that APOE4 carriers have more uh, tau uh, pit signal than non carriers. Um, if you see uh, here, this is uh, true when you control for a lot of variables, including clinical phenotype, including amyloid PET. So this would be an effect of APOE4 that is um, affecting tau pathology independently from amyloid. And, you know, th this was so focal. And even it, when you loosen the um, statistical threshold, it was still very restricted to the medial temporal lobe. I, I was a little doubtful of this at first. And then there's this paper that came out. This is a paper from, from the group in Montreal. Um, they, they show in two cohorts in ADNI and, and in their own data set, um, um, the same finding. I think this, these are not only two different um, cohorts, these are two different uh, tau tracers. And then there's this paper from the uh, MGH Boston group showing um, you know, effect of age amyloid on, on tau, but also um, actually in, when you control for age and amyloid, you can still see an effect of APOE4 very focally on this medial temporal lobe. So this seems to be one of the most robust finding I've seen, um, which is kind of surprising given how small this cluster is, but it seems to be there in, in many, many different data sets. All right, so just to, to summarize a little bit, um, we saw across uh, both neuroimaging and, and postmortem um, data sets that um, the clinical variability was really associated with tau uh, way more than with amyloid um, pathology differences. Um, what is really intriguing to us at this point is trying to figure out why um, these patterns of tau would differ. And I'm thinking specifically about the different phenotypes. We don't know if um, it might be related to some genetic differences that um, explain differential uh, regional vulnerability to tau. Uh, there's also very interesting uh, literature showing that um, the premorbid, um, like showing a higher prevalence of early developmental dif um, um, differences in uh, patients who uh, would end up uh, developing uh, these atypical variants of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there's data fr from our center and, and others um, uh, across uh, different centers actually showing that patients would develop this uh, language uh, predominant uh, um, phenotype of Alzheimer's disease tend to have a higher prevalence of dyslexia in younger age. And similarly, there, there might be um, some um, uh, early uh, life uh, developmental differences in mathematical and visual spatial abilities in patient who will end up uh, developing PCA, the, uh, the visual spatial predominant form. So the idea is that maybe uh, these early uh, life differences would 
like basically the tau pathology doesn't happen in a vacuum and it happens on a brain that is pre-wired or that has pre-existing differences that might explain why tau pathology is going to happen in these regions more than than others i'm not saying i just want to make clear that i'm not saying that dyslexia is a risk factor for alzheimer's disease i'm saying that risk uh, dyslexia might be a risk factor for alzheimer's disease presenting as a logopedic variant PPA when Alzheimer's pathology happens later in life. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, the, the two in any, any Alzheimer's class or a lecture, you, you can get, um, uh, you're always told that older age and APOE4 are the main risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. I think they're not just risk factors, they also modify the way the disease is presenting. And, you know, age is associated with less, um, like younger, age, um, older age, is associated with less uh, tau in the cortex. APOE4 is associated with more tau in the medial temporal lobe. So basically this like ratio of how much pathology is in the medial temporal lobe compared to the cortex is higher in these um, two um, uh, situations. And so basically it tells you that um, these two factors are associated with this quote unquote typical presentation of, of Alzheimer's disease that is more medial temporal lobe predominant, more amnestic. And what's interesting is that these effects seems to be really uh, directly uh, on tau and, and not uh, through uh, not going through an amyloid pathway. Um, and um, to summarize the um, age of onset finding, uh, we do see that there's this uh, reversed um, a relationship with younger patients having more tau but less copathologies. Um, the idea of you know why patients with late onset don't have as much tau might have to do with how much uh, how many pathologies they have in their brain. And maybe the fact that they have all the things going on lowers the threshold uh, for tau to be clinically um, uh, relevant. Um, we also don't know, maybe, maybe the tau pathology that happens in early life or in late life uh, is not exactly the same from, from the biochemical perspective. Um, and maybe it's not the pathology that's different. Maybe it's because the brain uh, itself, you know, a pathology that happens to a brain that's 40 years old versus a brain that's eight years old. Uh, happens in a different context. So maybe it's the interaction between the pathology and the pre-morbid uh, pre brain that explains these differences. Um, you know, the, the clinical uh, relevance of the Alzheimer's uh, neuropathology is hard to estimate. Um, I think the problem in, in the current stage of the field is that we have biomarkers that work pretty well, uh, although, you know, there are problems regarding cost and, and, and different things, but we, we can detect amyloid and tau, uh, the problem is that we cannot really detect so much of the other things. So we might be biased towards giving too much importance to amyloid and tau, because when we see amyloid and tau in a patient, we tend to attribute symptoms to, to these pathologies when actually it might be related, some of it might be related to the other things going on. Uh, but we do think that, the, um, you know, uh, it, it, we have to think about this when we design clinical trials to lower amyloid and tau uh, pathologies in the brain, because how much... Um, um, how much impact can we expect uh, based on the fact that other uh, uh, pathologies are happening here? Um, so I think that's just a summary of what I want to um, talk to you about today. And again, want to thank you for the invitation and, and thank um, the tons of people who uh, worked on this. That's wonderful. Thank you, Renaud. Uh, there's a huge amount amount of data there um, and uh, I think that the, the whole team here will uh, maybe take a minute to to digest and consider their questions. I mean first of all I would just uh, make a couple of comments which is to applaud your work looking at uh, sort of thinking about this as a spectrum or dimensional a sort of dimensional model of of AD and maybe dementia more broadly. Um, uh, I think, you know, I, actually I've worked in the past on autism and schizophrenia, and these are both areas where people have looked at uh, uh, trying to characterize the condition in, the, in terms of a spectrum or, or multiple dimensions. It, com it comes with a huge number of challenges of its own, um, but it does create a model that's really intriguing for delving into and constructing hypotheses, which I think, you, you know, you've really demonstrated here today. I, I would also uh, also like to, to agree with you that your comments about the neuro pathology measurements. I, I think the standard clinical neuropathological measurements, which we do use as a, as, a, as, a, as a kind of ground truth very often, a lot of the ones that are in clinical use are um, somewhat limited by being semi-quantitative. As you said, you know, they're very influenced by 
a sort of binary, did you see some tangles or plaques in a region or not, that, that kind of thing. And I, I mean, that was a huge motivation in my own work to, to look increasingly at getting continuous data, quantitative assessments. And that's what we've been creating in the company to, to take forward as a measurement that you can use in MRI. Um, so uh, I think this is this is very much up our street, very much of interest to us. Uh, are there any questions from uh, from the group here? And can I remind you all to raise your hands, either virtually or literally, and I'll uh, I'll pick I'll pick people to ask questions. Jed, you're first. You're first up. Yeah. Um, so you, I thought that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, you you touched on this briefly in your last slide. Um, about the implications of your work on, on different treatments. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit more, things like, um, you know, if, if there's much more tau in younger patients, is there a sense in which an anti-amyloid treatment is likely to be too late for them? Um, you know, if there's less tau in older patients, is there a sense that an anti-tau treatment might be less effective? That, that, that kind of thing, and probably other, other, other things that I'm sure you would have thought about. Yeah, no, I, th I think this is this is really um, really a great point, and this is something we try to think about a lot. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I do want to um, um, you know emphasize that these uh, this question, this specific question of age of onset, is something that hasn't really been um, looked at in details in trials, and and um, you know I do think that it has it should probably be a stratifying variable because we've seen too many differences in in the in between early like young and, and late um, onset mm -hmm. patients and I'll, I'll, again I want to I want to just emphasize that the you know the, this these plus I'm showing with pet imaging where younger patients have way more tau than than older uh, they're clinically in terms of MMSC or CGR like all the global scales the patients are similar so mm -hmm. if you just um, and which is really um, pretty striking you know usually when we look at scans we uh we sometimes like play um this game where we're trying to identify like to guess the patient's age based on just the scan because it's it's really it's really um you know visually striking i i think i think regarding trials um we really need to consider this i, I think it's a very important case uh, you're making about maybe actually you know once a patient have too much tau um what is the point in in lowering amyloid um it, it is like I, I think the new trials are really uh, acquiring a lot of data to try to understand if there are subgroups of patients, their treatments are effective. My guess is that, you know, based on what we see with these patients who have so much tau all over the brain, and we know that this tau is probably forecasting a very bad outcome for them, you know, within a year. Um, um, I, I don't think there is much point in lowering amyloid in these patients. It's like amyloid is, is past history, probably. For these patients, uh, but maybe for older patients who don't have so much tau yet, um, we can maybe, um, you know, if this whole cascade is true, uh, maybe getting rid of amyloid in these older patients might, um, you know, work more uh, because amyloid hasn't triggered all the um, downstream tau yet. But the problem is that, um, like we showed, um, the older patients also have a lot of things in the brain that is unrelated to Alzheimer's disease. Right. So the proportion, you know, it's hard. We can't really do that. But the proportion of their symptoms or their severity that can be attributed to um, Alzheimer's pathology as amyloid and tau might not be really big. So, you know, I don't know how much um, uh, efficacy, clinical efficacy, we can expect from a treatment that's targeting one pathways, uh, one pathway in, in in these patients who seem to have a lot. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, Mario, question. Mario was first to put his hand up. Sorry, Dimitri, we'll come to you next. Okay. Go, Mario. Hi, thanks for this uh, great talk. Um, microglia seems to play an important role in the initiation and progression of tau pathology. Uh, and AD risk genes such as uh, TRIM2 or HIPOE might modulate the response of microglia to tau. Do you think these aspects and their interaction contribute to disease heterogeneity. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a it's it's a frustrating part of the story for us because uh, we haven't been able to 
really image um, this part of the story. And, and there are tracers out there. It's always very complicated to get, you know, so many tracers, uh, so many scans and, and the same patients. I do feel like, I think to me, the, the main argument is the one you brought up of the all the GWAS studies. And like, we know, we know that um, uh, inflammation and like, we know it plays a role. We know it's important for the disease. And I agree that there's, um, you know, there's a chance that it's not necessarily a, a role as a causing um, factor, but maybe as a modulating factor somehow, how it uh, relates to um, how these pathologies trigger the downstream uh, 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 step. And also actually, you know, they are, um, I, I, I mentioned some of the, of the um, uh, data with like early life uh, developmental differences and how it might impact the way uh, the disease distributes. There's also d data, not necessarily only for the Alzheimer, Alzheimer's world, but uh, from other neurodegenerative diseases, suggesting that um, um, immune, um, you know, the, uh, deficits or, or diseases of the immune system might be related to higher uh, prevalence of some pathologies than others. So there's something, I think to me, the problem is that for now, like for us as neuroimaging person, uh, people, uh, the inflammation part of the story is kind of a black box that we can't really probe as much as we, we wish we could, I think, but definitely important. Yeah, okay. I have time. Dimitri, oh, uh, let, let's come to Demetra next. She's waiting and then we can maybe come back. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I found it very interesting, uh, really interesting. Uh, and I have two questions, actually. The first one, uh, you talk about uh, higher now in the court in the cortex uh, in um, younger patients and also females and I would like to ask and sorry if, I, if you mentioned that I missed it uh, if there was a specific like, cortical region that either for females or for um, young patients you know that saw a higher difference um, and the second one is a uh, if you think uh, Pet tau could be um, used like in clinical practice um, in the future because you did mention uh, differences in uh, you know uh, spatial differences uh, that could differentiate uh, AD subtypes um, you know in tau accumulation and also so uh, Susan Landau uh, that made me um, think of the meta ROIs for FTG pet so yeah if something like similar you know looking at uh, regions of interest would be a um, something, you know, that would be used in clinical practice. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Uh, these are all really great questions. I, I think, you know, the, the age, um, the effect of age of onset, I think it's really, we really see it. It's pretty widespread, but we definitely see it in mainly in, in parietal and frontal cortices. Um, the temporal lobe doesn't show that relationship with age. Um, I showed the, the hippocampus, but it's also like most of the temporal lobe doesn't doesn't show this relationship, which is kind of good because I think a lot of papers, you know, you're talking about meta the like Susan's um, meta OI um, for FDG for for Talpet, we tend to use a lot of the um, this um, this thing that a lot of people call um, meta OI as well for Talpet that is mainly um, ca um, grabbing data from the temporal cortex, which is good because then it's kind of invariant of, of the syndrome and, and the age of onset. And it's kind of like the common denominator um, for tau pathology. And, uh, you know, even our, uh, our atypical variants, um, even a patient with posterior, posterior cortical atrophy with a lot of occipital tau, they also have temporal tau. So we're not missing them out with uh, taking this, this temporal um, um, cortex. The, the problem is that I, th I think there's two different things is that if we're trying to detect the presence of, of tau and Alzheimer's pathology at large, it's sufficient. If we if you're trying to say positive or negative, it's going to work. The problem is that then you know it goes back to one of the concepts that I introduced early on of like measuring tracking disease progression in patients, and it's it's going to be hard if you're measuring brain atrophy or if you're measuring tau. It's going to be hard to um, think of one region, one like in that simple way, one region that would be good to capture disease progression in everyone. Because in the patient with posterior cortical atrophy, you're going to find differences in, in tau, but you know, uh, in the temporal cortex, but, and you might increase a little bit over time, but this is not the main regions that's going to increase. So if you're just measuring temporal cortex for everyone, you're kind of going to 
uh, underestimate how much these patients progress because they're progressing more in a different region. So I think this is um, this is definitely going to be uh, an issue. And uh, going back to the sex difference, we didn't really see a pattern. It was kind of all over the place, um, a little bit as if the female, um, uh, the tau pathology in females was um, like, you know, one step ahead, like a little more progressed overall, um, as far as we've seen. And um, yeah, you know, I, I think the, the clinical, um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the I'm glad this is 8 a.m. because I, I wouldn't be able to keep all of this in mind at five. Um, but um, in terms of clinical uh, use, you know, I don't think TALPA is going to be the thing that everyone is going to get. It's 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 not consumable for many reasons, practical, uh, financial, many things. I do think that it's very important in trials right now because we need to we need to uh, both be able to stratify um, uh, patients and also see. Um, you know, the, the key thing, and even in, well, if, if you're targeting tau pathology, of course, you want to image tau pathology to see if you're engaging the target, right? Just like all the anti-amyloid treatments. Uh, we don't know if they really work clinically, but we know they remove amyloid. Um, so at least they're not failing because they're not uh, engaging their target. Um, for tau, I think it's going to be interesting. If you're targeting tau, you need to make sure uh, tau is uh, moving, uh, changing. But actually, if you're targeting amyloid, like you really want to know if it's going to have an impact on, on, on tau. So I think for trial, it's going to be super important um, in clinical practice, probably not, uh, maybe in some very specific cases. Uh, the, the one thing I've been um, really successfully avoiding so far is any uh, presentation or question on plasma uh, because I, I need to keep my job. Uh, but I was just um, about to ask that as a follow up to Dimitri's question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a very big. Uh, well, actually, I, I'm also kind of shooting myself in the foot because I, I, I've been working on on some plasma uh, data. I actually, I, I'm just going to show this real quick. Um, but we have, um, you know, just want to show you uh, uh, here. Uh, this is the relationship uh, in in patients in our patients with um, um, they're all amyloid positive um, MCI or dementia, and this is their um, plasma P tau two seventeen and the tau bit signal. There's a strong correlation, you know, but there's also a lot of variability in this like um, triangle shape. And I think the, the, the thing is that from what we've seen, you know, if you select patients with a given plasma value, there's a, a wide range of, of tau that you uh, tau pet signal. And if you look at the, the cases, you know, you have like some patients who are amnestic and some patients who have, uh, you know, logopenic variant. So you can see this like very left predominant pattern. There's a lot of information in the imaging, and you know, I'm I, I'm sure I don't have to convince you that imaging has a lot of information embedded into it, but there's a lot of information here that you will not get from a plasma measure. The plasma is probably going to be great for diagnosis, for helping the diagnosis. It's not going to make the entire di diagnosis, but I think for clinical practice, you know, the plasma is going to help um, um, give answers, uh, and help it might be more a research tool and in very specific um, uh, situations. That's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Very I think just, sorry, Jay. Do you want to follow up on that specific? That specific thing. Oh, okay, go on then. On, on, on screen now, I guess, and, and related work. So um, I've heard suggestions that um, plasma tau um, relates relatively more to amyloid pet and relatively less to tau pet than one would expect. Is that what you've seen as well? Could you comment on that? Yeah, it's, um, I don't know if I have data here. Um, um, so he, here, you know, we're just seeing that like this is the plasma p tau, um, like the 217 mm. and 181. It, it doesn't really matter, but like uh, in amyloid positive and amyloid negative patients. And this is a mix of patients who have AD, FTD, normal controls, MCI, any type of diseases. Um, we do see that the, the plasma merges do um, really distinct, the, this tau plasma merger really distinguishes the amyloid positive um, and amyloid negative uh, cases pretty well in this sample. Um, I, I know what you're talking about, like the paper su suggesting that maybe P tau correlates more with amyloid pathology than with tau. And there's a new paper that I think is really interesting from um, still the, the same uh, Swedish group. Um, uh, 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 Niklas Madsen is the first author and suggesting that actually P tau in the plasma might be in between um, amyloid and, and tau. Mm. And I think the way we think about this is that maybe 
Taupe is a measure of the cumulative um, amount of uh, Taupe floaty, so global amount that has been built up. And the fluid markers in the CSF and in the plasma might be more um, kind of like the, the, the rates of, of, um, of um, ongoing tau pathology that is triggered by amyloid. So it might, it's triggered by amyloid, so it might be related to amyloid. And it might be more uh, like the, um, uh, like, you know, like tau pet would be the integral, the integral and, and p tau would be more like the, the rate of change at the given time. Hmm. But it's still an hypothesis, like a, a working hypothesis, but I think this is the way a lot of people think about it right now. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. So you certainly don't need to persuade us that uh, the spatial information from imaging is, uh, we think, is very useful. And certainly we've, we've published data showing different patterns in different in different kinds of dementia and, and and as you have done with the posterior cortical atrophy for example um, so we think that's that's really powerful with our measurements as well um, I wanted to follow up on quickly uh, on the age of onset relationship um, that you were talking about and you said that there's an absence of the of the correlation in the temporal lobe medial temporal lobe perhaps surprisingly or perhaps not as you, as you indicated um, but I was wondering if if one of the issues there is that is that effectively in your data set that's already reached some kind of ceiling, and I think I did notice in one of the graphs that the the, the, the scale on the y axis was was a little bit different for the temporal lobe, and 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 you know is that is that an effect, and would it suggest that actually if you just if we were if you were assessing it in a in a group of subjects who were somehow you know prodromal pre morbid, um, you might you might pick up that subsequently emerging. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a very great point. That's I, I I totally agree with what you said. Um, you know, maybe the 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 way we're talking about patterns here might have to do more with like the relative distribution of pathology overall uh, than the absolute. Because I, I agree that there's no um, like it might seem that maybe the the tau uh, the temporal tau burden is kind of plateauing. Uh, somehow, the one question though, like that, it doesn't solve is like, if there's am, as much tau in early and late onset, why for the same given amount of tau pathology in the temporal lobe, why do some have uh, additional in the cortex and some don't? And so I think it doesn't solve like, because apparently for some patients they didn't wait until they saturated the temporal lobe to go to the cortex. So mm -hmm. why is this? And there, there might be something that has to do with either. Um, you know, regional vulnerability to accumulate tau or uh, regional uh, or vulnerabilities to spreading tau um, outside uh, earlier on, you know, as soon as there are some tau, maybe it spreads somewhere else, whereas in some other patients, it kind of accumulates locally before moving elsewhere. And I think this might be the difference between the early and the late onset. Yeah, that's good. Um, and do you think uh, sort of broadly about this issue of vulnerability in regions and regional patterns? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm always a bit intrigued about this in terms of thinking what could be the causes, of course, uh, lots that we don't know. But, um, you know, if you had to put your money on something, would you say, you know, do you think it's more to do with some kind of gene expression in different regions? Is it connectivity? Um, uh, or is it sort of intrinsic vulnerability to do with plasticity? You know, what, what do you think are the, are the key factors along those lines? Yeah, I really wish I, I knew. Uh, to me, this is like the most uh, interesting, um, you know, interesting question to work on right now. And I, I don't think I don't think we can answer because I don't think we have any um, data that can really help us uh, tackle this question. Um, ideally, we'd want to have you know, data uh, of this patient um, pre-morbid, pre-disease. Uh, pre um, the problem is that because these diseases are rare, it's it's kind of complicated to scan a lot of people and hope for, you know, wait for a few of them to develop these syndromes. So I don't know, I, I think we'll have to, um, you know, I'm expecting, um, th there's very few um, uh, genetic data on, on these cases because they're rare and because they've been, um, they haven't been, you know, the, the whole big data set, like uh, data sharing for this kind of thing is, is pretty recent. So we have a lot of data in, in cl classical AD, but now I think we, we're gonna have um, the possibility to share a large um, 
large data sets of biomarker confirmed patient with these diseases. Because th this is the issue as well, right? Th these syndromes are, are, are rare, but also they're not always related to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, if we can do some genetic analysis of these patients, um, only selecting those who have amyloid um, and tau pathology, maybe we can detect why in some patients, you know, not genetic factors that drive um, amyloid and tau pathology, but uh, genetic differences that drive why some patients uh, develop tau in different regions. Um, I think this, this is going to be a, a really important thing to do. Thanks. So actually, I think that we're almost at the hour. Maybe we've got time for one last quick question. Omar. Oh can I stay with you? I'll be, I'll be very quick. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. I had loads of questions, but I'll just ask some uh, one question and a statement as well. Are you planning to improve the representation of your study? I think you acknowledged that it wasn't well represented. Uh, is that is that a plan for the future? Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a very uh, a very important thing uh, that we have to do, and we're working on it right now. It's um, you know it's uh, there, there's a lot of um, initiatives, especially. Uh, I think in, in the Alzheimer's field in general, I think the early onset uh, is uh, early onset dementia are even less studies. There's even more disparities in early onset study, um, uh, early onset dementia um, uh, investigations, and we're working on it. It's um, we we have to do this. Uh, and and my second point, very quickly, I, I hope. I mean, your study is fantastic. Uh, my eyes have been opened up with tau load and tau presence at early onset. I think it has a huge potential for becoming a clinical trial. The issue is going to be heterogeneity and also patient recruitment, getting such a young population into a clinical trial for worries of, of, of tau presence. I'm really curious because uh, the industry, at least the pharmaceutical industry, is kind of had its time with amyloid and is now trying to move this big monolith towards tau, only to find out maybe perhaps that late onset is going to have very little tau presence uh, and therefore there could be some implications. So I hope you get your, your research fast-tracked into, into the minds of pharma and biotech industry as quickly as possible, because that's going to be valuable. Anyway, time's up. No, no, it's, it's great. But actually, um, you know, our lab is really involved in this. Um, there's a, a study that I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called LEADS for Longitudinal, Longitudinal Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease Study. Um, yeah, I think I have. Um, yeah. So it's basically we're, we're doing like the ADNI kind of like uh, it's, it's meant to be comparable to ADNI in many ways but only looking at um, uh, early onset AD. And, and I think the way it, it's, it's kind of like a mix between, um, I, I would say Leeds and, and maybe Diane uh, in, in that uh, where um, we really have a, um, the mindset of, of directing it towards a trial, um, you know, having options for trials because this, this like you said, this, these are rare, uh, but we have a network of like 15 or 16 centers now uh, recruiting uh, hundreds of patients. So, we hope that if, if anything, this would be a very important population to, 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 to include in trials. Yep. Great, yeah. Thanks for squeezing in that extra last point, Omar, actually. It is, it is in, indeed a very good one. Um, so, we, so in a way, I would just like to add my, uh, my support as well to that, which is to say, you know, thank you again, Renaud, for, very, uh, for sharing with us a very enlightening set of studies. And I think, you know, some really exciting ideas, which I, I think that we will we will we will definitely watch your progress. We'll keenly pursue things that that may be complementary in some ways, and I hope we 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 will stay in touch and perhaps work together uh, if if there's an opportunity. That's great to have you present to us today, and thank you very much for your time this morning. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the weekend. I guess now. Thank yes. You, you too. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks for now.